Hello, everybody. It's Monday. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Hello, hello. How do, how do you pick, how do you, uh, have you ever done this Spotify thing of picking songs based purely on the number of beats per minute? Um, no, I don't tend to, does, does Spotify surface that? Uh, I have not I, seen I was able to find it once, or maybe no, I No, Bryce, it. he made it up to <laughs> trick you into saying, yes, I've done this, oh, and he'd no, no. be like, ha, like, it it's not be, a real thing, you liar. It may be liar. gone, it, but, 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 mm. but the, the reason was is uh, I, I, if I'm going to be playing a video game while on an exercise bike, mm. there are a few things I want. Number one, I don't want to know lyrics. You can have lyrics, just don't make them in English. I don't want to be listening to them because I'm trying to play my Hearthstone. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, although, although nowadays it'll be Marvel Snap. Uh, second of all, uh, you can pick by uh, beats per minute so that you can kind of hit music that's going to be that do 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 do, which which is kind of a slower uh, beat, but mm -hmm. it's something that your legs can actually keep up with. That feels hmm. good. Interesting. Yeah, I've never seen that, or I've n I haven't seen that column pop up for for beats per minute. I'm sure they have like playlists and stuff that are like that too. Yeah, like, or, or maybe that that might be what it is. I just uh, search for something something BPM, and then I listen to a song. And I'm like, not fast enough. Uh, you know? <laughs> I know when I'm making, uh, we have a playlist for Marbles, the the Himbo Hams playlist, and uh, uh, my criteria for that is the intro has to be very good because we probably won't listen to the end of the song. Oh yeah, but we are gonna listen to the beginning of it. So like, I had to get rid of. Uh, Baby got back because that intro is just so long. Oh my god! Oh my, oh my god. god! That intro Becky. is so long. Look at her. <laughs> Look at that butt. intro. It is so long. It's. <laughs> uh, is that was was there was there was another one that had something like that. Hi everybody, it's Monday. We are streaming. It's a rainy day here in Austin, Texas. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, did did you happen to see Bonnie sent me a photo this morning? You know, uh, uh, Josie turned 15. We'll do this before the show, so because it's a vis mm. visual gag. But Josie turned 15, so we got a giant you know, balloons, a one and a five, and some balloons and stuff. Um, ah, oh. uh, if you check my Twitter feed, you can see a picture of what Bonnie was greeted by this morning uh, after after all all that party. Sure. Let me go see here. Uh, there you go. Right there. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> like that. That's that. That's that. Six thirty in the morning humor, <laughs> where, uh, where you just text your significant other, "What's up?" <laughs> hey, uh, Andrew, can you check if you are muted? I shouldn't be. Oh, okay. For some reason, I saw you. I saw your lips move, and I didn't hear you. But I didn't know if you were just. I don't know. It's how I read, Bryce. Thank you for making fun of me. <laughs> he needed to read one. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> one man. balloon, balloon. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're going to start with the Weird Things program here in just a minute. How's everybody doing on a Monday? Uh, Nice and cool. It's a little too cool. Yeah. Too Remember cool. when you were a kid and quarters looked bigger? God, they used to seem whole, uh, like... Uh, uh, yeah, they feel like a nickel to me now. Yeah, and, mm. and, and do, doing magic, um, uh, there would be stuff like, uh, you know, do this with a silver dollar. I'm like, that's not happening, but I can't do it with a Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I, I don't know. The quarters so, seem the same to me. All right, fine. I, <laughs> I seem incredibly normal. Well, so and I don't... and uh, <laughs> uh, some people can do the rolling quarters with with half dollars or silver dollars. Oh. I I never could. It, it's got to be a quarter because that's the size of my, uh, of my Digit. my knuckles. Nickel, yeah. First time I ever saw somebody do it was with a nickel. What? Whoa! I guess that's a little. Hey. Big. <laughs> I guess that's a Welcome. efficient way to do it. It's, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's a fun size. It's close. No, I'm saying that they're close. They're similar in size. He was some guy I met on an airplane as like a teenager, and he was like, I guess he was like a ski instructor or a ski bum, and I think he was probably just like a gigolo or something. It was just very interesting. Uh, were you able? Uh, were, were you able to get it go, to go forward and backwards? I, I never. No, God, 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 no. Like I'm no. thrilled if I, I could do I it five times in a row. Oh, nope. Apparently today is not my day. All righty. Uh, are you guys ready to do some weird things? Ready, ready. Oh, I, I will say just a little pro tip there. Yeah. Um, I was playing around with some metal coins. Like I had the like this is what I this is what this is what I practice with, you know. Um, but uh, I'd set my wallet down, 
and it attached. Oh, it's magnetic. So now wherever I go, I've got a coin and you can even, it, the magnet even from the outside of your pocket can pick it. So you could do, you could do oh, just, a nice drop or whatever. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know what? Along that same line, I was fixing Josie's, uh, she needed her old hard drive in her new computer. So I took off the screws and I set them down and I set them near the phone and I lifted up the phone and there were only three screws there. And I looked and there's one spot because you've got the uh, the <laughs> uh, oh the that must have been what it was. It must have linked right yeah. on there. Okay. Yeah, there's MagSafe on there. Yeah, those little ones get picked up. Because I'll do that with a like a, I have a smart a smart case for my iPad here, and there's magnets in the corners of it here, so you can always get it like a uh, like hair bands. Sometimes hair bands will kind of. I guess the future is a lot more iron filing free than it would have been in the past. <laughs> yeah, Willy Willy yeah. yeah. had it all yeah. wrong. <laughs> well, uh, 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 one, one last note. Uh, one, one of the folks that could call the Bryce. modern rogue stuff. Um, the uh, uh, was uh, went to the Peacock Theater and saw a bunch of the Dallas uh, area magicians, including uh, or it brought in for I assume either a similar show to the uh, uh, to the one I experienced up there. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, asked me if uh, or I, I was like, hey, try to see so and so. And he was like, no, I ended up watching Jordan Gold. And I was like, did you tell me he did the electricity linking thing? And uh, and he was like, no, he did this other cool thing. I'm like, damn it, damn it. It's the best. It's the best trick, Andrew. It's it makes me so happy. Jordan's great. Jordan's a good buddy. Really good friend. He's mm. really good. All right. Well, uh, Jordan sounds very normal. He's moving near great. me now. He, he's Ooh. he's moving near Burbank where I live. He's like, ah, I'm moving. And it's, it's like. And I'm moving away. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> that's how that's how stinky you are. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna get your cooties on me. I don't know. All right, you guys wanna do some more things? Ready. Yeah. All right, Andrew, I'll count you in. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast, the best podcast ever with three hosts. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. And Bryce Castillo. Hello, everybody. It's just the three of us, like it always is. Yep, yep. It's a, it's a good number. Yeah. Nice round number. It's a magic three. number. Yeah. It's like a triangle, yeah. well, and it's really, that it's triangle's very strong. Yeah. It seems like adding any magic. more people would just make us real weak, real floppy. <laughs> we real know. like, oh, yeah. I can't. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I. I love this crazy age we are in, um, and and it is both exciting and terrifying. If you were, you know, you were an FTX, you know, pers person, you know, having stuff in there, maybe not so cool right now. And you know, crypto world's kind of crazy all over the place. It's still a fascinating thing, and I think we're all, I think we're all long term bullish on crypto here, but yeah. short term is when chaos reigns. Um, but I wasn't gonna talk about that, but yeah, that was that was certainly, you know, an interesting thing we'd probably be doing after things about. Um, the short story is the the future is gonna be a lot and it's gonna be a lot of fast things happening. There's not gonna be any kind of I don't think we're gonna get a calm or a quiet. Yeah, uh there I I'm very, very far out peripheral to the FTX story, but the um uh, the gist of it, as I understand it, is of the many cryptocurrencies that they were running, there was one that hackers were able to inject code to. And uh, I, I tend to gravitate to the human story, including the fact that this 30-year-old entrepreneur lost $15 billion overnight. And yeah. that's a... Whoa, wow. Yeah, I mean, there's several things that happened. First was... There was questions, were they solvent? They said they had solvency. They said that they, they said everybody's accounts would be liquid. And then it found turned out apparently that there's a sister company that SBF Sam Beckman Fried owned called Amuta Research. Apparently, again, they had loaned FTX had loaned billions of dollars to that company to trade on and in, made a in number the form, of bad trades. In the form of FTX bucks, right? Yeah, they're specifically well, owned but you, yeah. But using their people's money right? They, right they created another currency that they had controlled and they gave it to that and then it was converted or whatever but point is like it's you know there may be a maybe a completely innocent explanation for all but it was just just crazy but as i yeah. say is the, the point like it, it, this is a company that you know a few years ago didn't exist then out of nowhere i'd go through san francisco and i would see ftx signs everywhere with his face on it which you know 
is is sometimes a warning sign but uh you know you saw that everywhere and they were like a big like the second biggest crypto exchange and this is not the first time this has happened in crypto either i i remember it was it mount gox mtgox that well that was a theft that was an outright sure but that was also just the situation unpacked very quickly in terms of people's money no longer being available and i guess yeah uh, yeah yeah if 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 you're not somebody who's actively mining or you're just treating it like uh, any other kind of forex exchange like let's say you're you know 60 years old playing with retirement funds functionally <laughs> both of those are overnight money goes away phenomenons yeah. Yeah, and in FTX, the case was they were offering people 8% to put your money in there and told you it was safe, so you'd be making 8% interest per year. And so you had people who weren't necessarily trying to be trading that just wanted the idea of the security of being able to do that. But uh, I guess to say is like the thing that I thought about, I knew crypto was going to be big in the scale of it. And this was something I think I said like two years ago was that there was like, you know, a, a 30 million or 50 million or some hundred million dollar, or $400 million heist. And it never made the headlines. It was in news, but it was just, oh, by the way. And I'm like, if that happened in a traditional bank or anywhere else, that would be everywhere. But because it's that magic land of crypto, it doesn't get the same level of attention, which one tells you the scale of things there. And also, you're not hearing a lot of people crying, which... There are, but I mean, there are people affected by it, Sorry. but it was like, ah, it's just a, it's, it's a weird. Wait, wait, and and uh, uh, crypto has the, the reputation of being speculative the moment you set it, set foot in the door. Right. So it's a little bit tougher to, especially also crypto tends to attract younger demographics. So storytelling wise, again, this is broad brush here, but uh, we, we, we tend to less boohoo about 20 year olds who got wealthier than we are. And then now are back to our level <laughs> than we yeah. do about, you know, retirees yeah. losing their savings. It's it's a little bit of like the pivot to video math, right? Like 400 and what, what was the number? $473 million went missing. Well, like what, how much money was that when it got in, when it went into the to the service at first or, or because or, there was such a bubble i mean this is a this is a boom and bust currency well and uh, as is uh, i guess if we want to really go to the ten thousand foot view you know like even like who's boohooing for meta stock like the the people mm-hmm. yeah what is stock but faith in a company and then the company missteps or something well, doesn't perform well well um, i guess when, i mean when there are a lot of that? retirement funds I mean, that's, there's a lot like that. There's a lot of retirement funds and stuff that are new. And also too, like, I would say that I've, I've known, I know a financial advisor, uh, who said like, yeah, who told me like, yeah, I'm telling my, my, you know, I talked to him a year ago. So like, I'm telling my clients they should put like 10% or 20% of their assets in crypto. And I'm like, that's a lot. That seems, you know, like maybe that's your ratio of like, I, I'm, I'm like, I think let's figure things out a bit more because it just seems so volatile. Well, uh, uh, Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 Just let me get this quick plug in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm rereading. I'm now on my third lap of, of a book that I've recommended before, but the psychology of money and forgive me, I can't remember the author's name, but it's so, so good. It was originally a series of blog posts repurposed, made into a book. So each chapter is completely self-contained and, um, even, crypto for as rubbery and and bonkers as its volatility is uh morgan housel is the guy's Mm. name uh even that if you dollar cost averaged you'd probably end up winning um dollar cost averaging is magic we'll talk about it in after things uh but uh i don't know if you would have if you got in 18 months ago (laughs) like that i would say that Right, but but we got many more years to go mm-hmm. if you bought well, I, a crypto index fund and dollar cost average over time. Uh, what I'm saying is, I guess what I'm saying is, we have tons of stock market data uh, historically to look back and to see how that works. Crypto, we don't. We don't kind of know. That's my that's my concern is for like a person who's a conservative investor to look at like yeah like here's this this is so erratic. We don't have a ten year history to look back and say is it cyclical, whatever. We haven't seen how it survived or such. That's why I'd be hesitant. Well, uh, yeah. is, the important part is I cut off Bryce. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is is there outside of this the the specific crypto angle? Is it? Um, I, I I I'm not as bullish on on crypto necessarily, but is there an element of people getting bilked out of their money in this? Is there a major element of that? Because the money is there's money's coming from somewhere in a Ponzi scheme. That money moves up from generally. Well, uh, I mean, this is a very FTX broad thing. Remember, FTX was 
FTX was an account. You right. just say, I'm going to deposit $50,000, put my paycheck in there, and then be able to use it to trade crypto or whatever. Sure. And not just their coins, all coins. And, and again, outside of FTX specifically, but in general, yeah. like it for, for, uh, the losses of crypto come from somebody else. It's not even necessarily that like a coin or a business did bad. I mean, mismanagement aside, it's just it's money. It's it's changing cur- currencies, and it. Uh, I don't know if people are more likely to be, or I don't know. Well, uh, the, let, there have been let, scams let, let, and me, get rich quick schemes for decades let forever me, let me, yeah let me let me float a uh metaphor metaphor incoming um uh i think it's uh, i think all three of us would agree that uh, crypto is a frontier and i suspect that all frontiers are defined by um uh inefficiencies or um uh uh, 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 uh inelasticities or uh, mm-hmm. uh Frontiers, Limits. there's always scams in every frontier when mm-hmm. nobody knows the terrain and you're relying on a lo- whether it's a local uh, indigenous person to who promises to lead you the right path and not take you to an alligator den or whatever, mm-hmm. or whether it's a, a new housing in a booming market, whether it's a new type of currency. Gold rush. Uh, the oh, gold yeah. rush. I would imagine a lot of, as they often say, the people who got rich during the gold rush were the people selling the shovels, not not the people finding the gold. Yeah, uh, it's I don't know. Just I I feel like between between all the crypto stuff and then you know uh, apps. I'm about to get I'm going Andy Rooney on apps today. <laughs> uh, but things like you know whether it's a Robin Hood or it's or or a uh, a, a Bitcoin app, so, you know, it has become easier to use this very technical investing, you know, I mean, investing to, is serious and there are kind of hoops you normally have to go through for like the wall for Wall Street. Um, I, 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 I wonder if this is something where regulation may actually make crypto better or not, or a set of rules that people choose to abide by. I, I suspect but that I regulation, that. good good regulation is based on a robust data set, and frontiers are defined by a spare, a spare data set is about as mm. close as I want to wander <laughs> into that discussion. Sure. I, I, I think that, I, I think that the, for me, the problem is, is if you listen to Sam Bankman-Fried when he lectured you know, Congress on why crypto was more open and transparent than what happened in 2008. It's hysterical and sad because it's like, well, you know, we're open, what we're doing now, it turned out none of that apparently was true. Um, Had the system worked the way people want it to and the idealists in crypto say, then yes, it would have been. You would have known their transactions. You would have seen this, but people didn't care. And that's what I think my my, kind of my issue, I get into Mm. people where I'm like, I'm very into crypto, the concepts of this, blockchain technologies. I'm a big fan of where they could be but people right now, I talk I talk to a lot of, through my work, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and other people like this. And I'm like, I'm getting the same spiel I get from somebody from Amway who just sees money there and isn't really thinking like, okay, so do you have this thing in place? Well, no, but we could. Right. And But we know we don't have to because our customers don't really care because it's this is they're buying on impulse and emotion. And that's the thing that's like, that's the thing that's frightening to me is that regulation may come in when we don't want it. You know, it, it should have been can it self regulate faster to, to prevent because there's, you know, there's talk now well, we're just going to do digital dollars and things like that. And so that's yeah. my fear is that is it will it will get regulated in a way that's just not going to be helpful for it in the long run because of the opportunists and people weren't putting in things in place. that could have. Uh, this this kind of reminds me of an, another previous book that we've talked about is uh, the founders, uh, one of the founders of or the founders of the Ansari X Prize. Um, uh, abundance where they talk about how tournaments are kind of magical because all of the failures subsidize the success. And essentially what you do is you put a retail price of $10 million to whoever can go to space twice or, you know, the equivalent of a hundred million dollars to fly across the Atlantic. And a lot of people fail, but each, but in the background, everybody's watching all of the failures and learning from them. And what I suspect is we're just at a phase with crypto right now where uh, first we knew don't get your dollars stolen thank you uh, uh, other guys and now we know don't listen to liars <laughs> okay sure. now yeah. that's two down the 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 
the model you described, by the way, there, that's the same as TikTok and YouTube. Is that like, you know, and even like I was talking to somebody this weekend about publishing or screenplays. I said the problem with screenplays is there's going to be like a half a million screenplays will be written and maybe a couple thousand will actually get purchased. And so if you average the average amount of time spent by all humans on it, it's maybe $1 per hour or less that, you know, but you don't get that dollar per hour when you work on it. Somebody else gets that big pile because only one screenplay can can take that place. And And so there's a lot of markets. And and if I'm understanding the hierarchy, right, you, you know, much more about this than I do, Andrew, I'd be curious to, uh, to know if I'm reading it right. So let's, let's call it a dot for every screenplay that somebody writes. uh, It comes out to a dollar an hour. Then you get sort of uh, a good justification for a middle area of like the the writer's guild the wga or, or what have you where uh you're gonna write like there are there are writers who make very good upper middle class livings who never have anything make it to screen but they're part of this this class this tier this uh, dirty word cabal uh, 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 cartel uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call it but but the point is is they 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 all stand together so that uh uh, everybody can make a middle class living uh, pitching ideas, regardless of whose ideas actually make it to the screen. Yeah, um, and and just the challenge is that 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 helps sort of make sure that the studios pay fair wages, et cetera. The problem is still it's for every screenwriter who sold a screenplay last year. You know, there's five thousand that didn't. <laughs> you know, and that's that's the mm-hmm. you know it just it just and that's but, not to say it's a problem, but that's just sure. the way the the system works. Sure. And but also, I guess, in comparing this to, say, crypto, um, you know, a a writer, a writer's personal journey to sell, you know, their product or a product that they're on um, feels more self-contained, at least from the broad strokes versus getting other people's money involved, moving other people's mm-hmm. money around, you, which you, is, you, you know, you, you need a lot of trust, a lot of safety. There should be, you know, all of the things like like you said, Andrew, like. If crypto was what the, it is pitched as, then these things could have would have solutions. You'd be able to trace, find where that money went, figure out a way to get it back. But we're not even there yet. So how? So uh, I, I get I get the speculative nature of it, but it's but I do think it is distinct from going to Hollywood and trying to make it work. Well, and even Hollywood, though I kind of I kind of like this parallel. Uh, was at one point a hundred years ago a frontier, a literal frontier. That's why Hollywood exists, is because people wanted to cheat the patent that Thomas Edison had on moving picture shows. So they would shoot stuff in Mexico and then bring it across the border. That's the reason that all of the dollars on every old silver screen classic are Mexican two dollars. Okay. Um, so, but also. Even in that self-contained narrative, there's somebody who has a story and wants to pitch it. They have to go to the frontier, and that's the land of casting couches, of bad deals, of of stories where Humphrey Bogart had to buy his own clothes and spend all of his money to look fashionable because the studio wouldn't back up his uh, star-studded persona. It, it, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, it's it's frontiers. They're filthy. They're dirty. They're awesome. They're awful. They're great. Waiting for the awesome yeah, part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eventually it got awesome for, for, for those, you know. A little for, confetti for showed up on my phone when I lost all my money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another frontier is supporting this podcast. That's right. Yeah, nobody has ever done it. How come not one of you have ever paid us even $1? I defy anybody listening to my voice right now yeah. to prove that they've supported us in any way whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Here we are, alone on the backside of the moon. Welcome from the moon's butt. All uh-huh. we asked is for $1, and so far not one person has paid it. You Nobody. could be the very first person. Head on over to patreon.com slash weird thing. Get your own RSS feed. Get mm-hmm. access to our after thing after things segment. Yep. Sorry, I spat and I take it over, Bryce. You can listen to after things a few days earlier than everybody else. You can uh, get access to our Diamond Lounge in the Discord, uh, in our special Diamond Club Discord. If you want to get email updates on when podcasts come out, check it out. Patreon.com slash weird things. Support the show. Brian, uh, how much how much splash zone damage? Uh I had I had a salad, and so uh Boy, I don't know where that guy's been hiding out. Oh boy, that's <laughs> that's. Oh, call him Ranch because he's dressing everybody. <laughs> so you know who may come out ahead is Michael Lewis, who apparently had been shadowing Sam Bankman-Fried, Michael Lewis, Liars Poker, all those things, Moneyball, etc. 
That no writer, he'd been kidding. shadowing Sam Bakeman Freed. Already got the book deal and the movie deal. Already got it. <laughs> uh, uh, did, uh, question uh, Did the deal happen before or after the crash? <laughs> It turns it turns out uh, we found uh, the real killer. I mean, the <laughs> news broke to, the news broke today. So today, so he he probably was probably was pitching it, and then they're like, somebody says, we need this now. Now that we know how it ends, yeah, man, that's gonna be that that'll be an interesting story. It'll be it's a good story. It just needs yeah. an ending. <laughs> Bring you know that new ending you're looking for. <laughs> well, listen yeah. to this. Hollywood's just bringing in. <laughs> They just bring in the Enron guy. I know they are. That's what I saw. The, one of the F, one of the people who was like managing the FTX sale or whatever they're doing was working on Enron. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's right. Uh, the liquidation I, lawyer. Yeah. I have a I have a friend who teaches a class at Pepperdine called Accounting for Non Accounting Majors, and so every year I go talk. Last month I went in there and spoke with Michael Shermer, and a little name drop there for you. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Every year I see the same part. He talks about the Enron and he shows, I don't know if can't lay, what was the other guy? There was the guy whose job was to basically run was like CFO for finances for Enron, but also CFO for this company that they owned that was trading with it and buying up these things. And he's like, they're like, they asked, was that a conflict of interest? He's no. When I'm in this role, I do my fiduciary duty to them. And I'm over here, I do my fiduciary duty to them. And it's like that is like. And I've heard, I heard once heard an agent say that to me, and I kind of like lost it because I'm like, that's it's that not is the that's definition talk. of conflict <laughs> of interest. Yeah. And that's apparently was like Sam Bankman Freed had this investment firm, all of me to research, and then he had FTX, and then apparently he's like, other, well, right? we'll see. I that'll be, be wrong, exciting story. Could be case of mistaken identity, and you know, yeah. I'm gonna get the Ooh. stage playwrights to the story. We're gonna do it the, yes. the in the bard's tongue. I'm gonna I'm gonna not get any rights at all and just do a podcast on it. <laughs> <laughs> the official FTX podcast. Try and stop me. <laughs> With what money, so, jerks? <laughs> I want to I want to change it to some positive sort of topics here. Nice. Uh, I heard about uh, the on our space watch, <laughs> the <laughs> latest company that I'm excited to see what's going to happen, and they've got some pretty good people attached to them, including Alan Stern who was the lead of the New Horizon mission to Pluto, and that is Helicity Space. So H-E-L-I city space.com. Please tell me Helicity. it is a city on a giant helicarrier in the vein of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, where, where they figured out that they could take off rockets from a helicarrier and they're already closer to space. Powering humanity's the, the helium is for helium. Oh, uh, uh, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll still take it. A balloon takes you most of the way to space, <laughs> and then the rocket no. goes. Um, we've got a. Uh, there's a render here. What are we looking at, Andrew? Is this? They're working on fusion engines to power deep space space exploration. Whoa. Okay. But... Okay. 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 Uh, 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 if I may, if I may, um, there was. I want to say back in 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. Uh, back when the idea of any amount of autonomous driving for any vehicle sounded bonkers. Uh, there was a Cato Institute podcast I was listening to where uh, one of the lawmakers from Congress was saying, yeah, we're already planning the laws. That's how inevitable this appears to us, that, that, there, that we, we need to start legislating. So the fact that somebody is doing a startup based on a technology that does not yet exist is, <laughs> is not yet or does not yet uh, exist at the efficiency that it needs to be to make this work is is not bonkers. That's, may I remind you how uh, Bill Gates ran Microsoft? He was like, bloated code, as bloated as you want. Eventually, po uh, processors will get fast enough to, to run it. Yeah. Is, is that what we're looking at uh, with, with, with that kind of like uh, shoot first, then aim? Uh, I mean... I think that, I mean, th their, I think their strategy is let's just start thinking about this now and start developing it. So yeah, I think in a sense of like, try to get there, what, what problems do you need to solve? Cause a lot of times, you know, the engineering comes down to the little details. It's like, oh, we figured out that we could build this thing, but we just need a material that let us contain it in, you know, like, you know, space elevators, you know, our, our fun thing to talk about, they were, um, entirely a theoretical concept until graphite and buckyballs and those materials until we realized oh we we have found a material that might make this possible and so the materials question wasn't a matter of 
is it possible? It's just, what well, do we have the engineering resources to make that happen? Yeah. So now, how, how do they get some of their numbers? Like I'm looking at one screen here on their website saying, imagine going to Mars four times faster, only two months, large spaceships, abort capabilities, no need for planetary alignment. Is the, they're, so they're expecting this is not only more efficient, but just friggin' faster too. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the magic, it's the power of the magic word, if. If <laughs> well, yeah. we get fusion, and, and there's no reason that we can't. It's an, as, as Andrew pointed out, it's an engineering, not a, a breakthrough problem. Like, we look up at the sun. We know, we know fusion is possible. We just got to figure out how to uh, engineer our way to it. But yeah. I guess I, I assume what they're pitching is if we get it, <laughs> right. then, then we'll be doing that much faster than any kind of chemical plan. They say Mars in two months, Jupiter in a year, Pluto in three years, interstellar medium in 10 years. That would be the, the time it takes to get to those destinations. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm down for it. Hey, I mean, if it, if it could make me a pizza too, I mean, that's, put it in the kitchen sink. Well, so, so are they, uh, are they accepting funding right now or they're privately funded or what's the story here? I imagine they're, I, I, I'm not sure what stage they're in right now, but I presume, um, you know, you're always, you're always trying to get funding. So mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I imagine this won't be cheap. Yeah, no, they just, they just have a, a, a wait list at the moment. So publicly, this is just, uh, uh, just talking. We're just talking about fusion. And I mean, what, is there is well okay this is this is speculative now but is now it's speculative <laughs> are, are the conditions for fusion human uh, you know human activated fusion process are they that much better in space it, like are we gonna see the fusion rocket engine first or the terrestrial fusion power generator first uh, let, let, let me take a stab at it, or is and that I, missing I the trust boat? Andrew to correct me on this. Okay. So understand, this is Brian talking. Brian knows far less about this than Andrew. I want to hear Andrew's real answer. But as I understand it, um, the most expensive thing, like wh when your spacecraft is made partly of fuel and you need more fuel to move more mass, all of a sudden, like what you really want is antimatter. You want the most potential energy in the least amount of mass and uh, helium uh, in fusion would be orders of magnitude more efficient than anything we've been able to do so far. Hmm. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think that in, in order of operations, like I think this is much further out than if we're able to solve commercial, I mean, like terrestrial fusion energy. Like there are not a lot of details here because I keep looking through here to go like, well, the obvious answer is, and I don't know, because I don't know, they haven't really described you know, the way that what, you know, their fusion rocket would do, uh, yeah. you know, traditionally, because there are different ways that you can use it, use fusion to then superheat a medium that you then eject out the back of it. And that's traditionally like you can put a chemical fuel or whatever, you know, put water, anything you want, and then it superheats it and ejects it. So I'm assuming that it's a, tra a tradition, a conventional futuristic <laughs> fusion system mm. where it just generates so much heat that you then use to basically superheat whatever propellant you want to use yeah uh i actually i i just now remembered that i read a story that i don't know if either of you guys happen to have read this week um okay can, can i introduce the topic yeah yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah okay uh picture a reality television network that okay. has a special coming out mm -hmm. and picture uh that it's themed around the bermuda triangle uh, okay. do, do you know about this, Andrew? So, okay. Mm -mm. So this uh, uh, reality TV network um, or this reality special goes out looking for things in the Bermuda Triangle. Who's got a guess as to what they found? At the Actually at the Bermuda Triangle? In in the water. Oh. <laughs> in the water as they were exploring. Oh, is this a story about the UFO looking ship that they pulled out of the water? Some some might think it looks like a UFO. <gasps> How are they, if this is, if it's a story I'm thinking of, they're way the F off if they're trying to look for stuff in the Bermuda Triangle. That's the beauty of the Bermuda Triangle is that not only is it big, but you get to shrug and be loosey goosey when you count what things go okay. missing where. Because yeah. I know the biggest thing we found in the water was, but 
Well, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, a TV show found a piece of the space shuttle Challenger. <laughs> oh, Jiminy. Is that amazing? Wow. It's yeah. big too. Like, like you can sure. very much see the distinct um, uh, tile pattern on the bottom. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking and 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 all of those things. But uh, a, a, a History cha Channel exploring the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> show, <laughs> you know, the the uh, from from the network that brought us Aliens, uh, come Ber the this... Bermuda Triangle into cursed waters. I mean, this is uh, look not for nothing. Look, uh, they hit pay dirt. They uh, uh, yeah. they hit storytelling gold. Yeah. If only they yeah. if, if only there had been a story that already tipped people off about interesting things in the Bermuda Triangle. Isn't that right, Andrew? Wait, what? Wasn't that a plot point in Angel Killer? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bryce, I'm right about a lot of stuff. I'm Andrew Main. <laughs> but uh th this is fascinating. I mean, what a place to lose something. You know, the a they didn't, I don't think well. that it's there though. Like, I'm, it's the, the flight path. That's the thing I heard. I'm like, I, the first I didn't know there's a for me to try and connection. I'm like, like their flight path was like completely different. So. Oh, well, huh. uh, I, I mean, for all we know, this could be they they needed to shoot some supplemental B roll, and so they went off the coast of wherever, and they were just. It's you, an amazing find. I'm not right. dismissing the find at all. I'm like, look, oh, you didn't get it where I thought you were gonna get it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but, um, but but also that's sort of a hallmark of all the Bermuda Triangle stories is that uh, very rarely like a, a plane took off from New York headed towards the Caribbean. Never arrived. Bermuda Triangle. You know. Lost. Blah. Right. And then when you do it on the East Coast, yeah. it's manifest. <laughs> oh, do they call it manis manifest? No, that's the that NBC show about a plane that gets lost. Got it. Wow. Yeah, I I used to live. Uh, when I lived in Fort Lauderdale, I used to live at like within a block or two of one of the points of the Bermuda Triangle because it was the Naval Air Station in Fort Lauderdale was where this was. So I'm like, ah, oh, that's where you go to sleep at night, right at the edge. <laughs> uh, do, do we know where they found the wreckage? Hmm. Uh, I thought that's I saw a, a picture showing it uh, fairly far north of where I expected it to be. Uh, yeah, let's... Uh, north of the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, well, okay, look. Right. We, we, uh, it is canon that this certainly did not end up in the Bermuda Triangle. It was a Bermuda Triangle show. Uh, let's see. I wonder if we can find that map. I'm what, concerned about the lost film crew. <laughs> we started the Bermuda Triangle. You know, and... uh, wow. Uh, so, uh, you know what? I actually wonder... So, the, the nature of storytelling is that it would truly be remarkable, outrageous, crazy, uh, and way out there for them to totally have just happened upon this. It seems to me that somebody somewhere found a thing and then they're doing a special and then somebody said, well, you know, I heard that there's something there. For, for example, um, here's the thing I didn't know. Um, Bryce, if you don't mind huh? doing a little Google foo, yeah. tell, uh, what allegedly is the first manned flight in an airplane? Uh, the, the first, the, the, the Kitty Hawk flight uh, from the Wright brothers. Yeah, the, the, right. It would, it would be yeah, right. Uh, does, this says uh, December 17, 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So, from what I understand, according to again, because I'm rereading that Psychology and Money book, uh, and one of the points he makes is that uh, pessimism is, is fairly easy and uh, it's literally low calories because it takes more calories to think hard, I believe. Uh, it, it, all you have to do is take the current and project it forward. And he points out that uh, in 1905, the Wright brothers were flying overhead of humans in Dayton, Ohio. And people who saw it would think, uh, that's a weird trick. Uh, it looks, you know, looks an awful lot like someone's flying, just like we would say, ooh, that looks an awful lot like telepathy. And it wasn't until vetted, hardened reporters showed up in 1908 that they were like, no, guys, we're flying. Uh, but then, you know, pessimism ruled again, and it's like, well, it's not like we'll ever ship freight, freight by air. And then, you know, sure enough, that's what we're I, doing. <laughs> I have a book coming out where one of my main characters is an aviation pioneer. And new, like it is, you know, modern age of aviation. And, and literally what you just described is what she described is here's the problem, you know, because a lot of like Elon Musk goes through is like, you know, first they tell you you can't do it, then you do it, and they say, no, you didn't do it. And they said, okay, you did it, but is it really that big of a deal? 
you know, and well, then, and, and then and, like, well, everybody's doing it. And that's the thing is apparently that in, in, in the book, he points out that, that, uh, there's a 1950s book about the history of aviation and the moment they had proven it, everyone's like, duh, everyone knew you could fly. <laughs> you know? yeah. What well, it, it might be relative to like the, the thing that the Wright brothers don't get enough credit for. Um, they were weird. They were weird guys, but they were extremely, our brethren. Get credit for that. But <laughs> We're, we're all never changing married. our last neither name to Wright. <laughs> neither one of we're them, be the one of them ever got. Neither one of them ever got married. I think it was like Wilbur had said, "There's not room in my life for an airplane and a wife." Um, so <laughs> wow, you know, there's that dedicated but to the grind. They would ar- <laughs> two things: they would argue with each other back and forth, and they would switch positions, forcing themselves to think about it from a different point of view, which is an amazing. How did you? Because remember, at that time. It wasn't like nobody else was going flying. Nah, there was like a worldwide effort to develop flight, kind of like Fusion Now. There was the Smithsonian. Smithsonian was paying, you know, one of the leading aeronautical experts of the time, thousands and thousands of dollars in funding his research, you know, for this, which is why the Smithsonian for the longest time would not put the Wright Brothers airplane up because they were still hurt over the fact that they beat them to it. So you had this big effort around the world to do it. How did these guys do it? Well, there was that, that method for which they had to get closer to the truth. And the second thing was they kept failing and they went and said, what are, what are our assumptions here? And they pulled up the aeronautics tables that were written from like putting things in wind tunnels that were like 50 or 40 years old that everybody used. Everybody who was trying to do that, that was the holy grail. Like this is, if these are the ratios, they said, let's try it ourselves. They built their own wind tunnel, did their own and said, oh, these are wrong. And they changed it, went back to Kitty Hawk and it flew mm-hmm. and changed avian history. But everybody else was like, well, if we had that information, you know, it's like two that, guys, two bicycle mechanics. That there is, um, if we can finally make it about me for a second, um, <laughs> Mm. In, uh, as Did I'm, you invent the airplane? As I'm fond of pointing out, uh, first of all, just to put a pin in the Wright brothers, um, uh, that book, that book, uh, uh, the psychology of money is so good. He points out that uh, in 1899, there's a popular article explaining that well, Mother Nature pretty much has figured out everything that there is to figure out. And there's no winged creature that flies through the air that's more than 50 pounds. The last time I checked, humans weigh more than 50 pounds. Q E D. Yeah. There's no way humans could fly. You know. Yeah. Uh, and of course, what we didn't know is is aer- aerodynamics and lift. And as you pointed out, uh, Andrew, that they did their own research. Um, in economic circles, they talk about that gap as arbitrage, and it's where gigantic fortunes are made, uh, often speculative, sometimes resulting in disaster, as we talked about with crypto. But in the case of there's an informational arbitrage that that I have been exploiting for now 14 years. Uh, in that if somebody under the age of 15 was told that, mm, I don't know, their their Xbox was kidnapped and the only way they'd get it back is to learn this particular magic trick, they would spend all their time on their computer boxes trying to Google and find the answer. They would not find the answer and they would declare the answer has not been possible. He watched all the YouTube videos that there are and couldn't find it. Therefore, this trick must never be solved. The arbitrage (laughs) is me being 48 years old, has the ability to read a book from 1903. And as arcane and ridiculous and obscure as the grammatical impulses are in there, I at least understand, oh, you take the thing, put it in another thing. Now let me reimagine it with coasters. Here's, Mm -hmm. and now it's a YouTube video. Um, Yeah. The lazy zillennials. Uh, well, sorry. It's <laughs> it's also all humans. I mean, I don't know why anybody would uh, go go through and read all this. Stuff. I want to I want to meet the fifteen year old who is the decider on <laughs> what information is out. There. Here's my point: is that if if yeah. the known universe consists of YouTube tutorials, then why would you try to continue looking beyond the known universe? Because uh, it's not there. And then, meanwhile, if you're willing to you know, speak the language of, you know, archaeology or essentially archaeology, uh, then all of a sudden you have what uh, to a lot of people is brand new. The very first episode of Scam School, uh, I, I, I did a trick that was published by Martin Gardner 100 years ago uh, that has almost mm-hmm. certainly poisoned the lungs of children all over the world. You were saying? 
A uh, <laughs> hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. Uh, I, oh, I think it was 1940s. Uh, now it's all. It's almost a hundred years ago now. Okay. Uh, 80s is the new hundred for Brushwood. Uh, spe- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with this. Uh, speaking of which, yeah. I have one yeah, there, more. Well, oh, that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, oh, no, you, you go ahead. I'm going to send you a, a gift. Yeah, uh, I like gifts. Um, I hope it's cake. <laughs> I, I think that's a great point because, you know, I... Uh, in working in AI and working at large models and stuff that are trained on a lot of internet data and whatnot, you start to become aware of, oh, this is still just a fragment of human knowledge. You know, most books still, you know, maybe has all the books now because of the Google books project, but, but still so much more to read them and process them. Yeah. And then just the amount of data that's out there, it's just not online. It's not even for what we call data. It's in books and stuff. It's old. It's like, you know, MUM manuscripts, you know, our, our favorite magic magazine, like all this, all this sort of stuff that's there and then procedures and journal. I mean, it's just, and it's, it's the scary part is, is that the internet, you're like, I guess that's it. This data doesn't exist anywhere. And it's like, no, somebody might have it, you know, like I'm really into like choose your own adventure books and stuff and looking up the history of that. And like, uh-huh. you know, there might be somebody with a, a CSV file somewhere with a bunch of summaries or stuff of these things. It's just not online. It's just not there, but it exists. Uh, Andrew, yep. there's um, yep. in the world of magic, there's a few props that are so powerful, so good, that to even mention them by name is verboten in certain circles. And I as part names like TT, uh, correct. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were watching Miami Vice uh, from 1984-85. Uh, uh, will, will you please read the title of the book that Switek is reading uh, as he sits in the front seat that I just uh, sent over to you? Oh, did it not oh, arrive? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it did. I, I was waiting for it. Uh, what's, what's the title of that book he's reading? Oh, yeah, that's great. 50 Tricks with a Magical Device that I Will Not Name. God damn it. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, I have that book. Great book. It uh, is a great so, book. So fun fact, do you know who was one of the biggest exposures of the TT method? Uh, I, I believe the reputation unfairly goes to Penn and Teller because they taught a live audience, but they did not teach it on the air. But due to the Mandela effect, people remember it as though they taught it on the air. But I don't know the real answer. I don't know. This is not statistically, but uh, you know who... Do you know who the world's most famous person who did magic is? The world's most famous person who did magic. Oh, 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 oh. It's got to be Jackie Chan. Obama. I bet Obama did a trick at Muhammad like. Ali. Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah, that's oh. right. As a matter of fact, he did. In fact, he exposed it on 60 Minutes, and he did the trick. And then he said, uh, uh, the, anyway, Muhammad Ali is a very devout devout person and religiously does not believe in deception. So anyway, here's how this guy made that vanish at Applebee's. <laughs> like, it was amazing. He'll show wow. you. So I was watching uh, The Dark Side of the Ring, uh, which is the Vice document in Hulu about pro wrestling, and I highly recommend it. But there was a, uh, they show Muhammad Ali when they, they, did a, they did a WCW stroke of genius took a bunch of players to, you know, North Korea, including Muhammad Ali. And then you see like Muhammad Ali making a silk vanish and then in front of them. And then he goes and he shows them and he smiles and shows them how it works. It's just, I've, I've, you know, I've had friends that ran into him and like Muhammad Ali did that trick for him, which I think is amazing. You know, that just shows you that guy's heart. The thing that he wants to do is show you a little magic trick. Mm. Uh, yeah, and, and, and also not for nothing shows that magicians, you got less to worry about. Just know 12 tricks and you'll be good. <laughs> Instead of just five, no 12. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, and I, that method too, it's funny is, you know, I have friends that use that same method and you can want, you will never see it. You will never know that that's how they're doing something because it just, you can take it like, oh, I can't do this the simple way. Like, no, you put some time into it, and yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 method in question, uh, just Google Muhammad Ali magic trick. You guys will find it. <laughs> or um, yeah. just know that the method inherently is very deceptive. Mm-hmm. But even if you literally painted the method red, you could still pull it off if 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 you mm-hmm. were skilled. Mm-hmm. I think I, yeah. 
I think I'm I think I'm following most of the conversation. Yes. There you go. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my book recommendation <laughs> is Fifty Tricks with a Magical Device That Cannot Be Named. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good collection <laughs> from a while back. Hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, especially with Scam School and Scam Nation, we've, you know, we've, we've done so much thought, so much talking and thinking about exposing or, or what, sh- what we share, how we share it. Um, well, and even you know. now, and I guess we're veering into after things territory, but even now we have to rethink some of that because, um, the availability on TikTok is different. Um, like, oh, sure. We have to cut stuff differently on TikTok and, and and it it does bring up some of those things of like how huh? you know on YouTube we can we can show we can be as long as we need to and right. we generally try to give people a fair shake on what we're showing and, right. and like, the angles hey, and stuff. You clicked on this video. You watched the five minute performance. You spent seven minutes learning the uh, the method. You watched four minutes of right. discussion and breakdown or whatever. And you have to believe that that's not camera trickery or editing, right? Uh, even when. Sometimes it is. Um, you have to, you certainly have to believe that what you're seeing is a representation of reality. Yeah. Um, which is not always a given with magic or education or just YouTube in general. Um, and so I don't know. I but, feel like we do we we do we do it very well, and no one uh, gives us too much guff that I care about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, one more pick, one more, uh, excuse me, thing to bring up, which is cool. Uh, they're started, they just started human trials of lab grown blood. Ooh. Ooh, this is fascinating. So, can if I'm guessing, there's nothing inherently, just like there's nothing inherently magical about fusion, look up at the sun, it works. Uh, there's nothing inherently magical about red blood cells. They, what, something Stuffed iron, to the gills with them. oxygen? They it, it, they start with like stem cells that are able to produce red blood cells and start from there and then are able to grow mm. blood from that. Uh, so, uh, that's remarkable. Wow. And well, I mean, I guess that's so it, it's 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 uh, I guess uh, I don't know. It's it's interesting because stem cells are, you know, very flexible. They could do a lot. Um so this is, I don't know, let's put another check in the yes stem cell column for Bryce Castillo. Did, uh, yeah, what they, yeah, what they what they do is they start with a pool of about a half a million stem cells that results in about 50 billion red blood cells. They're saying that, like, we don't think this is going to replace traditional blood transfusion. We are just thinking about, like, rare blood disorders where you just can't, there's not enough that type of supply of blood. And apparently the amounts they produce were just a couple spoons. Here's here's the thing I will say. There is there is having an innovation, and then there's figuring out how to scale that innovation to another level. And that is a skill that we underappreciate. I would say that a certain entrepreneur who's been making a lot of headlines lately with his takeover of a social media company <laughs> does not get enough credit for his ability to scale things that nobody else could really scale. Because it is, is you'll hear like, well, here's, you know, there's a here's this other car company. I'm like, they're producing cars like, yeah, they produced this other company, put 4,000 cars on the road that they sold for $80,000, but each one of those cars cost them $500,000 to make, you know, because they can't scale it. And so you take a thing like this and I glad that they're being, you know, they're being like, Hey, conservative, like only a little bit rare blood types are there, but what surprised me, some enterprising person goes in there, looks at this process and says, Hmm, I think that we can increase this output by this X, X factor and, you know, now all blood will just be synthetic. Uh, uh, well, mm-hmm. And in fact, mm. I could even see like, uh, okay, so imagine imagine if changing your entire supply of blood was as normal as changing the oil in your car. The thing where... people are famously good at keeping up with. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Well, I, uh, I'll tell you what, man. If, if I stay young forever, I'm going to be real good at swapping out my blood every every 3,000 breaths. <laughs> Just <laughs> Jiminy, that is very often you're having I'm, to I'm go to the quick nap, loop. back up, swap my blood. <laughs> there, man, Jiffy Lube's got a new name. <laughs> Jiffy Lube needs a new name. I, I mean, how? Uh, okay, let's say let's say they do this. There's unlimited artificial blood. Um, which would you rather have? The artificial blood that closest 
mirrors human blood, right? It is designed to work and look and function exactly like human blood. It just doesn't have your DNA in it or something. Or do you want it to be like the Pennzoil high-end, you know, do you want a premium blood? Is premium blood too icky? Because it, it oh. feels a little icky. Oh, no, no, no. I, hold on. I think I love this because... Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is this is literally we were talking about Peter Thiel wanting vampire blood from young people. <laughs> uh, so if you think of each red blood cell as a store of oxygen, then just like batteries, you've got normal your batteries that your body makes. But then you've got like, I don't know, premium lithium ion that maybe at first if we extrapolate. So first for only people with rare blood disease as life heroic life saving measures, then as support measures for people who are on the frontiers for heroic works, whether it's, you know, repairing a space station and saving lives or what have you, mm -hmm. then elite performance athletes or whatever are, are using it. And then also the rich becomes, and famous. Well, well, eventually everyone, right? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not filling my car up with the nice stuff. Uh, oh, really? Uh, I'm getting uh, conventional. Yeah, wait, but, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't turn it down, would you? What what if that was all of a sudden like well, yeah, a benefit if it was that free, companies I mean, offer? Uh, yeah, that's not a good one. Would you rather? If, well, yeah. Bryce, would you, you're, would, you're... would you eat nachos for ten million dollars, Bryce? <laughs> but they have I, to have oh, steak no, no, on no. them. I, I, I thought you were saying that it felt icky. Uh, oh, like, so you mean like socially, so, yeah. socially icky? Not not like you wouldn't take it yourself. Right. It's a very haves and have nots, Got and it. it's very organic. It's very much. I'm not a like human. Dignity, the human spirit, whatever. But you know, Bryce, I if, so. if none of us bought iPhones because people who couldn't afford them, you know, wouldn't be able to buy them, then nobody would have phones now. That's right. In fact, the phones you had would vanish. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that, like, if there was no market demand for it, there wouldn't yeah. be competition to bring the price down. So you're you're just killing people, really. No, well, uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> if I may, as as uh, 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 as press secretary, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, th we were talking about failure subsidizing success. You know, it took it took the the T-Mobile uh, sidekick. To bring us you know, the BlackBerry, which brought us, you know, closer to uh, the revolution of this uh, iPhone, which brought us to smartphones and so on. So, I mm -hmm. mean, plus also it's like, um, in theory, the best version. I think, I think this is one of those like, like I don't know. There's, in theory, it shouldn't uh -huh. matter uh -huh. that everyone, including at least one person on this panel, already has a Tesla, and I don't. Uh, in theory, I should be happy that Tesla is advancing <laughs> electric cars. In theory, you should have one by now. Is that what it sounds I like? Mean, a... <laughs> <laughs> in theory, I I love my used Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> but we there there have been more pushes from all manufacturers to make to use more EV, more battery, um, you know, powered. Uh, well, and, automobiles and that is in no small part because of of the advances of tesla and and making and then catering to the very very high-end market with the roadster that, but, that and, subsidized and sticking with the concept right i mean they could have probably at any point sold the tesla name to chrysler and had them make higher you know cheap consumer hybrids that are as cheap as other consumer cars and still have these upper end things but they're are not they're sticking with the electric they're sticking with you know owning the process learning the process what have you so and, and i think that's i i i think that you know for that there's progress there because of that for sure but but does I, it bug you i <laughs> i i, 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 I remember when the roadster came out and i remember going oh and i was covering that and like would have loved to have had one and then when the model s came out you know i'm like oh man i'd like to have that one but it wasn't just justifiable and the model x with the wings i'm like when I have that um and then you know they came out with the model three which you know was significantly less than the other ones of course yeah. now the prices have creeped up on those and I was cool with that I was totally fine with that I'm not going to be at that part of the marketplace but I'll be at that market where you know when it gets to there yeah so uh it I guess this is a moment to acknowledge all of the heroes the crazy people who went for treatments especially biological treatments um before they were common like people who had 
uh, just they would just have a, a optometry, uh, opto, obst, uh, op, uh, not obstetrician, <laughs> uh, <laughs> ophthalmologist, just just <laughs> take a scalp, scalpel to their eye. Like oh, I don't know, you're gonna lean back. I'm just gonna yeah. take this. Knife. Cut me, Rocky. Cut I'm me. A, I'm, a, I'm gonna cut your eye open. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna personally with my fingers wedge this in and then lay it down. And then now we have lasers to do all that stuff. Like those those crazy people. Yeah. I, I, do you remember who the pioneers were in radial keratotomy, which was the precursor to LASIK? I don't. Uh, Jer Jeremy Lasers. Jeremy Lasers. <laughs> uh, the Wright brothers. <laughs> the Russians. Really? Oh, the Russians no. were looking at, and they would do literally an assembly line of how you'd see these people laying on these tables and they get moved from like station to station, which was terrifying. But they had actually, they were pioneers in RK. Uh, they they, they were, were also like, pioneers. We're like, they're like, we're like, why don't you use lasers? And they're like, how many rocks do we beat together to make a laser? We're like, never mind. Uh, so, uh, 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 tough time to praise the Russians, but um, <laughs> when America was developing the first artificial heart lung machine, this thing that would pump out blood, oxygenate it, and then pump it back in, uh, do you know what the Russians used? Oh, please tell me not a real heart. Ice. They figured out they could do open heart surgery if they just put somebody in butcher's meat packing ice, ripped open his chest, and had a nurse squeeze <laughs> while they worked on it. Wow. And they were they were able to successfully conduct heart surgery. That's why I couldn't watch that show, The Nick. I just, old timey <laughs> medical, I can't do it. It's I, leeches. And just, uh, I watched Unchained on Delu in college. I'm good. I'm good on me medical grossness. Done. <laughs> oh, I'm reading up on RK, radio keratotomy, uh, invented in 1974 by Svitslotsky Fedorov, a Russian ophthalmologist. RK incisions are made with a diamond knife. Oh. Uh, that's because corneas are famously hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got you to really... It's better to have away. it and not need it than need it and not have it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm glad we've got lasers. Yeah. I'm glad we got, I'm glad we got cameras and lasers. I'm glad we have crazy people who will let so, oh, Russians let me give you the story. cut their eyes open. So, there, were, there were some prior... Japanese had done some prior stuff in 1936, but in 1974... Slitzlatsa Fedorov removed glass from the eye of a boy who had been in an accident. The boy who required glasses for correction of myopia caused by astigmatism fell off his bicycle. His glasses shattered on impact and glass particles lodged in both eyes. Mm. To save the boy's vision, Fedorov performed an operation which consisted of making numerous radial incisions extending from the pupil to the periphery of the cornea in a radial pattern like the spokes of the wheel. After the glass was removed by this method and the cornea healed, Fidio found that the boy's visual acuity had improved significantly. So some dumb kid took a spill on his cheap Soviet glasses that shattered into his eyes, and we now have, I have LASIK. That, uh, I, I guess that, that speaks to that progress, where at first it's life-saving measures, or, or like, what, what else are you going to do? You're about to lose that eye. Sure. And then it becomes well, what have performance we lost by making kids wear helmets? What have we lost by <laughs> making kids? I mean, uh, uh, looking cool. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're not as cool as we used to be with our broken yeah. necks. Well, what's I next? You going to stop kids the... from smoking cigarettes? I've, I've heard everything. We're the concussion gang. <laughs> hey, man, have we introduced ourselves? We're the concussion gang. Hey, well, you want to join the concussion uh, gang? That's what I'm in. I have a, a coral... Uh, James Randy, the amazing Randy, uh, there is a magic effect, which I will not describe how it works, but we'll call it the appearing cane, <laughs> in which a cane appears. <laughs> okay, so, all right. The cane, the, the cane may have a sharp edge for no reason that's, uh, you know. Relevant. Relevant to how it may work. Sure. Apparently, Randy once did the appearing cane, and it went up and it shot him and hit him in the eye. Oh, dear. <gasps> um, you know, there's a separate trick that I'm wait, familiar with. That wait, that, wait, wait, wait. Wait, when it healed... He no longer needed corrective lenses. <laughs> For reals? Wow. For real. Well, you know, when uh, real. when when my dad uh, my dad had um, surgery for uh, astigmatism a few years ago, and and they were like, we can fix we can just fix your lens. We could just fix your eye while we're down here. We have to cut the whole thing open. We could just fix it while we're in there. And they did, and it's and it's 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 
it's crazy to think about because because we have LASIK, which is m- more non-invasive. But th- I was watching; they were cutting his, his the, dang thing the open. Hood, the hood was open. Yeah, they, <laughs> they were had... like, "You want us to change the oil while we're here?" <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm going to keep my contacts for a while. <laughs> I'll probably keep my. Uh, contacts. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we, I think we've talked a bit about this, but um, uh, I'm aware that I'm a prime candidate for LASIK, um, and I know it's probably superstitious because my parents, uh, their experience is not mine. But you know, my Ooh. previous g- generation, Ooh. they all got their eyes fixed. Ten years later, they all needed glasses again, and so I'm like, well, if I only have one coupon, it's sort of like, you know, my father-in-law mm. needs to get a knee replaced, and they're all like, yeah, you only get one, <laughs> and then after that, so if you can hold off, hold off. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Uh, because I I would have assumed that was the that's the whole meme about Le- LASIK, right? It's like, oh, it's it's better than it's ever been before. <laughs> the, the newest iPhone is the best they've ever made. It's always the better, yeah. <laughs> um, I, but I, then they I, crust I, over, I had, or you need to touch them up. I had it 22 years ago, 22 years ago, and I still have like 2020 vision. And I can, and they're telling me like, oh, you're gonna need reading glasses. Uh, reading glasses probably help, but I can still pick up in a book, read. And, yeah, yeah like, and that's true. I mean, I've got horrible vision. Even getting close to 2020 would be an improvement over the Coke bottles I gotta wear. Yeah, I um, uh, I I'm deeply in love with. The fact that I have, I'm extremely nearsighted, uh, as I'm fond of pointing out, uh, I can actually see my own fingerprint uh, uncorrected. But the moment I put on glasses, I, I don't know. It's like if, if, I'd rather I'd, would you straight up if you had to decide mm-hmm. to you, you'll have to wear corrective lenses for one or the other. Would you rather be very nearsighted or very farsighted? Mm. Because I spend most have... of my time looking at a screen. Not for driving. I'd rather not need glasses. I uh, oh well, and no. I'm sure I'm gonna need like I do keep reading glasses because I pick up really small print, you know. So I do. It has. I know that, that, but I also know that a lot of it's the muscle thing, and that's mm-hmm. one of the dangerous things. Is it not dangerous, but you start to go, oh, it's hard. It's like yeah, as you get older, those muscles much slower, and you start wearing reading glasses, and they don't get stronger. You know, they yeah. don't. They kind of get bad faster like i remember when i started i had mild vision problems once i started got wearing glasses oh because you didn't need to flex as as hard oh yeah yeah Uh, interesting i would i would keep i'm i'm also super nearsighted i would keep that i i i don't know if it's i i think the this is selfish maybe but when i'm when i'm in bed uh and it's like in the morning or it's at night i can just Put my phone right here and just see it without needing to put the glasses no, I'm on. I'm on that same team. So, team uh, near. Yeah. Well, uh, a listener, write in. You tell us what you think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what sightedness you would like. <laughs> Check out the email list info with the in the show notes. Uh, picks. And just yeah. picks. I got a pick. What you got? Uh, I um, uh, I'm gonna uh. uh I'm gonna. I got two picks. I'm gonna double down on my pick last week of uh, Tunic, the um, or or two weeks ago the uh, the sort of adventure game where uh, you don't know what's going on and the game manual is written in a runic language. Um, I beat it over the weekend, um, and uh, I thought it's great. But the reason I think it is especially great is because. Uh, I got stuck. I got stuck real bad. There's a boss. Um, there's a boss at one point, and you, uh, I couldn't beat it. I couldn't beat the boss. I was like, I was banging my head against it for hours, and I, it was at the point where I was like, I'm gonna stop playing this game if I keep failing like this. Like this is not a threat. It's just that's how I respond to games and stuff. Uh, but Tunic is very cool. Has a lot of accessibility options for making combat easier or giving you more stamina. Uh, and so uh, I turned that on, and I just vroom, finished finished the game and had a great time. I'm really glad I saw the end of the game, and I'm glad I did it myself um, because I think there's also just, like, a really fantastic game here. If, uh, if you like something like The Witness or uh, Fez where just not everything's given to you, some things are just never given to you, um, uh, I, I think you might like Tunic. Um, I even went back. So they've got the game manual, and it's written in all these – runic uh, characters and stuff as so if someone online has translated it all and it's like it is great it's like an awesome story um and you don't need to do that to to understand it but it is all there it's not just gibberish like there's actually a 
a phonetic system so you could learn that language in the game if you really wanted to spend the time so uh uh that's that's tunic and then the other game is uh uh, uh let's build a zoo on uh, i've been playing that on the playstation and that's really cool it's um uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. You build a zoo, and it's got this really cool pixel art style, um, and uh, it lets you build like really big, uh, detailed zoos. Um, they got a lot of animals. They've got CRISPR in it, so you can make hybrids. Like, uh, what do I have? Like, I have a, a goose capybara hybrid, and so he's got uh, the big capybara body, and then like a little goose head, um, stuff like that. That's a, it's a fun game. Let's build a zoo. So check those out. Uh, I think we've made a game in and of itself of not saying the game that I'm playing uh, <laughs> because Justin and I will descend into craziness. Uh, but uh, boy, Marvel Snap is so good uh, from the team that worked on uh, Hearthstone. Um, uh, I, I never played much World of Warcraft. I did play Warcraft. But uh, so as a result, the lore doesn't resonate me, but resonate with me the way the Marvel Universe does. Um, I had one of those great moments where I realized after having a card for weeks or a couple weeks, why it does what it does. Um, uh, Andrew, did you ever read the Secret Wars comic books? Like the original Secret Wars? Yep, back in the early 80s. Yeah, yeah. Spider-Man got the symbiote suit. Oh, yeah. Correct, oh, yeah. correct. So there, there's a card in the game, uh, Colossus. His special ability is that he cannot be destroyed. And I was like, well, that's weird. Why is that? And then... This morning, I remembered the fact that of all the heroes who get destroyed in one cataclysmic blast from Doctor Doom, uh, only Colossus survives because uh, Claw whispers in Doctor Doom's ears that, well, I don't know, what if he turned into metal just as that bomb went off? And Doctor Doom, having infinite power at that moment, says, oh my god, you planted that in my subconscious, and now, because of rules, it must have happened. And uh, and then it did. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, like that's some deep lore. A 40-year-old comic book that I loved as a kid is the reason for a gameplay dynamic in this card game. It's it's delightful. It's great. They're really short, three to six minutes tops each one. It's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. And they've got a their onboarding stuff is very good. Like the first couple of hours that you play are scripted to hell, but they're they're fantastic. They make you feel like you never know when you're getting out of that loop of. Um, am I in the tutorial or am I playing the game? Yeah. Is this a real person? Um, but oh wait, no, that 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 dude's name definitely is a phallus. Okay, then that's <laughs> the, a real okay, person. I'm in the real thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Andrew, you get a pick. Um, first I'm gonna is the Dark Side of the Ring, which was a uh, Vice documentary series, three seasons on pro wrestling and stories that you may have heard, and they go they go deeper into the details of like the Montreal screw job. Um, you know, they follow up on, you know, there was a great documentary years ago on Jake the Snake Lawler, and then they kind of go into this and go more into his, his, you know, he had his brother and sister and, and just different, some of the high profile stuff you saw there, uh, the, you know, some of the, you know, the dark stories of wrestlers, you know, killing family members and themselves, and then some mm -hmm. of the, the, you know, other sorts of stuff like Owen Hart's death, et cetera. So uh, I, I, I thought it's pretty well, you know, fairly well done. And, you know, they have to make allowances for not having access to, they, they use some WDB footage. So I think they're kind of working in the line of what they can get away with, but then they do these reenactments, which I actually think they did pretty well. Like they, they're kind of like, they get people that, like, you'll see somebody we're in the art, you know, locker room talking and you see this sort of abstract locker room with some guy talking to like a guy, a, a blur, one blur talking to a blur that you're pretty sure is supposed to be Hulk Hogan. So I think they did that pretty well. You don't feel like you're, you're missing too much out on the visuals. So I enjoyed that. Uh, it's great. It makes me um, understand mu much more about wrestling. I remember watching, um, I think it's the slap heard around the world <laughs> about John Stossel getting smacked down. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was amazing. Nice. Yeah, it's funny is that Dr. D, the guy who did that, David Schultz, was actually a friend of my father's because he became a bounty hunter. And my dad had fugitives that David Schultz, because they talk about David Schultz, the guy who did that when I became a bounty hunter. It's like, that's why I knew him. I've got a post, I got a you know signed autograph from Dr. D saying, Hey, let me know if your brother picks on you. I'll take care of him. Wow. So uh, <laughs> that was what, and then I've, you know, I've met John Stossel. So it's sort of like, well, I never asked him about that. And then uh, they did one on uh, uh, Chris Canyon and Chris Canyon was a very complicated kind of guy who uh, eventually ended up taking his own life. And 
throughout his wrestling career who was trying to deal with both bipolar disorder and the fact that he was gay and and a point in time where if you came out earlier on like that then you'd become you know the clown or whatever but um i had met chris before like uh chris and uh uh mitchell the guy who's the Van Horn, the guy who's like Ted, Mr. Rolls, who speaks about it. He brought him and another one of the wrestlers that was like I, Iceberg, you know, over by the James Randy Foundation once and I showed him around, hung out, went and, you know, grabbed some lunch with him and talked to them. And it's just a super, super nice guy. But then you just watch, you know, that that exit story and then his life continues on. And then, you know, Chris went through a lot of difficulties and, you know, sad. But they talked to a number of, you know, younger wrestlers that he helped out, that, that he helped train and one guy talks like, yeah, we're, I'm putting on this little match in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, you know, Chris, who was still had a big, you know, fame from his WWE days came out and, uh, you know, went out and, uh, wrestled and let him beat him, you know, put him over. And, you know, he said that he didn't, he didn't have to do that, but he did that. He wanted me to win in front of my crowd and did the heel, the show Canyon being the heel, like you dummies, I came here. Like just, it's so funny. Cause you watch like the shtick of like, you know, like, you know, you single tooth, blah, 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 whatever. And, the, ah! and then, you know, oh. Chris gets beat. And that's just. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. So That's cool. And you saw that on, on Hulu, you said? Dark Side of the Ring? Yeah, Hulu. Hulu has that, yeah. Very cool. So my other my other, other pick, small pick, is, uh, you know, it's a great soundtrack. Like a really kick-ass soundtrack. What? Andor. Oh my God! Have you noticed that they're changing up the me- like? It's the same theme done in a different style, and then one time they just did a Blade Runner style. Oh my God! I was, uh, I was so I was gonna ask like, can we talk about Andor? Uh, that was a great episode yes. ten. Yeah, they do. They have episodes. Volume one is episodes one through four. So I think they're doing three. They're going to be doing like three installments of that. I I, I could quibble about pacing and some of like, but. Great show, really enjoyed it. This was the best line for the Star Wars universe. Uh, yeah, Seems, and uh, you know, uh, there I'd are let, theories let that ups make Star Wars. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's that? Uh, oh no, I'm 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 stopping myself from just gushing <laughs> about Andor. Uh, Bryce has had enough. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's a good show. It's good. It's good even. I've watched every ep- every every episode twice. Oh, I believe it. Oh, I believe <laughs> it. <laughs> I did that with Mandalorian early on, and then I realized if I want to watch this episode again, just watch next week's episode. Oh, hey, all, right. all right, all right, all right. How's it, how's it been? <laughs> it's been weird. Oh. It's been really weird, guys. It's been weird. It's Maybe is it three? Is it three of us? Maybe it's because it's always three of us. Maybe always because it's always three of us. All right, you guys want to do uh, take a short break and yeah. we'll come back for some after things. Brb. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the stream. We're watching it. We're doing the whole dang thing. I am. I I got a message from my trivia group. Yo, man. What's up? And they said to me, "Oh my gosh, if you get on the." email list if you get on the email list for the trivia thing they will give you a hint as to what is coming up on the rounds of the trivia it's not like yeah you need well no but one of them was like yeah it's gonna be like music about california we're gonna have a lot of music about california and 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 now this is not hubris i'm not saying i don't need to study for trivia but i'm not going to str- i'm not going to study for bar trivia i'm not gonna go study for bar trivia the the chance to split a 30 dollars gift card um is not particularly strong um i mean winning's winning rocks uh we almost oh we almost won last week by the way we uh tied for first and then we lost the tiebreaker but i think we were pretty close to it but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna study. I'm. I'm not studying for trivia. I'm not doing it. I, the fact that I go is the studying. Going is studying. That's. That's what I say. That's what I've been saying. Hello, everybody. We're gonna do after things in just a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. By the way, coming up tomorrow, great night, here on Twitch.tv/slash Night Attack. Um, that'll be in the evening. 
we're gonna do some more bones on the weekend. We're gonna get uh, we're getting some some modern rogue stuff worked out. Um, doing the tiki talkies, tiki talkies. Uh, what else? What else? All sorts of good stuff. But uh, hello, everybody. We're we're in between the shows. We're in be we're in between the shows. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, if you are following Marbles, uh, we just wrapped up our fourth season a few weeks back, and uh, we are going to be doing some Saturday races. Uh, we're testing out a new Saturday league, so we're going to do a few Saturday races in November and December, um, and then we'll be back with season five at the end of, or at the start of 23. 23, so check that out, Marbles.win. I, and Andor's good. Yeah, like, there's so many good shows. The thing is, there's so many good shows. My 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 brother, who I don't really talk to, texted me out of the out of the blue the other day. I was like, "Oh, have you heard of Chains Chainsaw Suit? Ch that Chainsaw Suit, but Chainsaw Man." Um, and I'd heard it's I heard it's great. Um, and he was like recommending it to me. Um, there is it, it is a very interesting phenomenon because a lot of times a lot of good stuff will come out all at once. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, my when I was working on a book, uh, you know, wasn't watching as much stuff. And then we had a couple things go on. My wife and I are traveling. And then we needed to catch up on certain shows like House of Dragon. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I caught up on Rings of Power. And then, you know, trying to watch, you know, you sometimes pay catch up and there's more stuff to come out. Yeah. And sometimes it gets lost in the cracks. And that's why sometimes it's cool to just see, like, what are people talking about a year later? Like, mm. if somebody came up to me now, I was like, oh, what are your biggest picks in the last two years? I'd be like, yeah. devs and severance. Yeah. You know, someone have recommended to me, this is the first time someone I think has done it, at least to me, I've recommended older stuff, but someone recommended uh, uh, the 2018 Amazon Studios film, Suspiria. They made they made a remake of Suspiria on Amazon Prime. I and it's great. I don't know what the original Suspiria was. Um, it was an I want to say it was an Italian. Uh, Dario horror. Argento. Um, but it uh, this yeah this, Dario Argento yeah, this uh this takes place in divided Berlin, and uh, 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 an American girl joins a dance troupe with strange occurrences going on. Um. It's great. Tilda Tilda Swinton is in it and is fantastic. Uh, what's the main girl? Not Chloe Grace Moretz. Uh, Dakota Johnson. Dakota Johnson is the main girl. Um, very cool. Highly recommend. But that's from 2018. He had recommended it to me, and I was like, "Oh, this is not even like the hot new thing. I just this is just a four year old film. We're getting we're getting long enough in the streaming stuff that like, oh, that's an old Netflix thing. That's just an old Netflix thing from ten years ago. I'm here for it. Uh, hooray old stuff. Nothing new needs to be created. It's all been made before. <laughs> you just want shorter versions of things that were already published. That's all you want. I just want morsels. Well, you know what's a, a treasure trove of that is the old Twilight Zone and Outer Limits episodes mm. where you would watch one that was like like Richard Matheson wrote the screenplay, who was you know one of the most adapted genre writers out there. And that was kind mm. of the thing that was sort of interesting to see is like, a lot of these kind of old premises, you're like, oh yeah, this is 19, you know, 62. How they were trying to figure out like what would it mean to have like powerful computers and stuff. Yeah, and still very prescient messages in a lot of that. In in a lot of that. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh oh, actually, do you guys mind vamping for like 60 seconds? I need to use the restroom. Sure. Uh, so uh, one of the one of the things about the uh, Twilight Zones is that boy. It's it's dangerously close to learning like the twelve different magic tricks that are possible, and then once you once you watch enough Twilight Zone, you begin to see, oh wait, all of these could be five minute vignettes uh, or two hour long movies. I, yeah, I would say that the good yeah, a lot of them. It's a lot of teleplay. It's a lot of like we have six locations and this da, 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 and you're gonna fit it into there, and, and it can be a little bit there, but it really good ones. Like, I'm a big fan of Richard Matheson because he understood, like, I would be like, you know, my problem is you'd say, like, I'd be like, ah, a guy discovers he can walk through walls. Matheson would be like, oh, a uh, guy's on parole for robbing banks and wants to, you know, walk a straight and narrow, finds out he can walk through walls. And you're like, oh, his complications are going to be way more interesting than my generic guy. 
And right. that's what I appreciate. Like some of the really good ones is they would get like, okay, we could do 12 episodes of what if you could fly. And each time it's going to be a very different person that discovers they could fly. And that's where really good storytelling comes from. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the other nice thing is that, um, uh, as we saw, uh, you watched uh, werewolf by night, right? Just watched it last night. Loved it. Thought it was really so, fun. Uh, one of the moments that I realized is that uh, it was charming and in the aesthetic that that the Wolfman version of the character was basically a dude looked like the the evil thing on the airplane from the William Shatner episode. You know, it was it was it was very right. rudimentary, but, right. but the storytelling was good enough that it didn't matter. Night. Oh, is is darker that the name of the episode? No, I was saying he looks like a darker Nightcrawler. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe well, a they, little bit what, puffier in the, uh, <laughs> but what they did, uh, I'm thinking that, yeah, what they did was, uh, what I thought they did They said, okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a furry fang dude. It doesn't increase in mass was fine. Cause they made him agile. They made him very, very agile, which I thought was oh, okay, cool. Cause there was a scene, a great camera shot. You won't spoil it, but you're like, where is he? And then you see where he is and you're like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I uh, love the fact they did that. I hope they do more of those like 50 minute, put some production value into it, get some good actors, do it. Don't feel like it's got to be, you know, it can, the beautiful thing about Marvel is that, yes, we will cast this character as him and spoiler alert, we'll have man thing. So when they show up later on, people aren't going, wait, what? They'll go, oh yeah, that was in. You know. Yeah. All right. You guys want to do some after things? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Andrew, I will count you uh, in. I'll count you on to count in in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm your host, Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yo, yo. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. Just get right through that intro and right into the show without a bunch of other dumb names to have to say. Uh, right. Uh, into it. I, Only I, three I, names. It, it feels natural. It feels right. It's the best somebody. amount of names, I think. Uh, hey, I got Particularly breaking. one of those names is three names. Oh, that's double duty, you know. It's quite, and yeah. now he's quiet quitting. No. And whoever is it? <laughs> now all is of it? a sudden, it's an odd number of total <laughs> names. It's very weird. Oh, uh, hey, yeah. I got breaking news for you. <laughs> uh, we talk about uh, being an independent creator. One of the things that, when you're an independent creator, you don't get to have complete and co total control over the platforms that you're on. Sure. You just make your best guess. Uh, you take your best stab, and you keep on stabbing. And um, in in our case, you know, one of the things that 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 we've talked about is. Yeah, good stories eventually uh, get a break. They get a moment in the sunshine, and you never know when it's going to hit. But guess what happened this weekend? In 15 years of doing YouTube, the sum total of all properties combined, uh, the biggest day I ever had with anything I was affiliated with was yesterday, and it was YouTube Shorts. Biggest day in what in what metric? If people uh, oh, don't, uh, sorry, views. Uh, 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 biggest number of views ever. Um, uh, in the, a single day period. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and and the previous winner was the day before on Saturday. Like oh. <laughs> you can literally hmm. watch a switch a get trend here. turned on, and then uh, you can see at roughly three p.m. when the algorithm goes to experiment and and decides to try uh, audition, as it were, you know, uh, to a small group. Uh, we yeah. had... Uh, oh, wow, this one's almost at a million views. Holy crap. What did yep, yep. Wow. Yep. Uh, I'm missed... it's... This one's at two million. Yep. Where did that happen? Yep, okay. This okay, is... so... I, I've, been, I've been trying to play it cool, <laughs> but I understood over the weekend. I was like, look, I know I'm cashing in a favor, <laughs> but could you, could you maybe... <laughs> well, and I, I, this, is, this is specifically interesting as far as the sh especially short-form video goes. Where you know we've talked about we're doing YouTube Shorts and we're doing TikToks, uh, a, a TikTok channel, and um, this is this is fascinating to me. I'm I'm having a very real reaction to this because we've had a lot of we've had a number of videos go viral, over a million views on TikTok. A number of them. Some of them happened most recently as like a couple weeks ago. Um, and with TikTok, I feel like what we've seen is like a lot of highs and a lot of lows multiple two three million view clips some that hit like two or three thousand some that take a while to break out of the hundreds and and boy is everything very very rubbery if you mm -hmm. have any doubt as to whether you are the star or not tiktok will remind you very quickly that no tiktok is the star yeah. you are the talent and whereas youtube 
Uh, it's very difficult to get started. You have to build up a reputation. You have to keep showing up. And it's this crazy robot middle manager that won't tell you what it wants, but will reward you when you accidentally do, do what right. it likes. Uh, and it will reward you very slowly over time. And it was a very, very challenging thing for us to make the commitment to almost every day post a short on two channels trying to get caught up and as we go into the holiday season to recapture some of that excitement and, and attention yeah. but boy oh boy they they flipped a switch over the weekend and unlike tiktok where i have no doubt next time we have a video go to two million it'll be that video only and the next video will get 800 views whereas well this one it's, mm -hmm. it's fascinating because I've been watching the comments. You can see people diving into the back catalog. You can see individual humans who very clearly are overnight. They've never seen us. They're diving in and they're commenting on every single video. So every 30 minutes, I see a new comment from the same person. And so I'm like, hi, welcome. Yeah, we did that. Check out this other episode. Did sure. you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's strange because there's a certain amount of... Uh, for lack of a better term, there's a certain amount of astroturfing going on from the platforms, right? On, on TikTok, it's almost unavoidable at the moment. You don't control what you see. It is it is channel surfing, you know, right. um, where YouTube, you have a little more discretion of what you want to watch, what you click to watch. Um, so so that, that to me has always seemed a little like an asterisk on when we've had videos go popular on, on TikTok. Because like right now, we're having a video from September, a clip from September that is being shown to a lot of people and getting a lot of comments. I don't know why. It doesn't seem like anyone particularly has shared it lately that, that I can see. Um, whereas with YouTube, we've seen really consistent numbers of they are slow growing numbers, um, probably just due to the fact that we have a lot of folks already subscribed on YouTube. Um, but then like, this is our first time, this really is our first time seeing one of these short videos break out of even a hundred thousand views. Right. Um, so to have two of them over, you know, one of them almost at a million, the other over two million is really interesting. That's not how we've found YouTube works. You know, we don't tend to have a video go viral a week or two later yes. in general. Uh, wait, wait, here, I'm going to take a uh, I'll send you a screen capture uh, that you could show. But um, the and that that I guess the the question for for after things is. Do, do you want overnight success? Because that comes usually at the cost of being on a platform that will give you overnight failure. <laughs> or do you, like, along with that slow growth on the YouTube platform comes a bit of grace where we can do something a little bit nutty. Like, if, if, if I do videos of nothing but me getting kicked in the crotch and they do very well on TikTok, the moment in the first one second you see my daughter's face, they're like, whatever, that's not getting kicked in the crotch. You know, I, give me that. Sure. Uh, People whereas, are fickle in this paradigm. Wh whereas YouTube will I, at least get close to actually promising to show your content to a decent chunk of your audience. I would, I would say that slow and steady is sort of like the way, you know, we all want to be the phenomenon. We all want to just burst out of the gates and everybody love what we do. But when you study those people, you realize that that's really the earlier your point of success, if you hit some success at some point, the earlier you have it generally, it's not as sustainable and whatnot. And you know, like, you know, Orson Welles peaked at 26, you know, made Citizen Kane. Oh, imagine. Oh, wow. Like, wow. Oh, wow. That, that's very difficult. Uh, granted. Now, uh, see, when I was, when I was 26, I probably would have had more of this worry, but now as a, more secure 32 year old i feel confident in not worrying about my theoretical peak or my hypothetical mm -hmm. peak am i past my peak am i you know my back's not hurting yet but i mean my neck hurts a little well, bit sometimes where well, yeah part of what happens though is that like i've seen this with celebrities that you know when you talk to them up close you see that they're sort of frozen at the time of which they hit the peak of their success and it's how they think the world works and sometimes that can be helpful, but sometimes you'll see, that's why like it was kind of funny early, you know, internet and Twitter was watching clueless celebrities who just didn't get it. And cause they thought they were in a world where they were the center of attention and had PR people and things like that and mm -hmm. couldn't understand why anybody could comment. But I guess what to say is that uh, uh, if you have a little bit, if you take longer and you work towards it, you're more robust because like it, it's not like you're, 
Brian Brushwood, YouTuber slash TikTok person. You're Brian Brushwood, podcaster, live streamer, live performer, all of those things. Like you're in all the different mediums. And so if I hope YouTube stories works. Uh, oh, the shorts, yeah. shorts. Well, and who knows? Yeah, shorts, but, yeah. but but here's one thing I know for a fact, which is if somebody follows you on TikTok, that's not your subscriber, and that's an outside ecosystem. Who's to say that the government doesn't pass a law for whatever reason, oh, yeah. and suddenly they're gone? But whereas, at least with YouTube Shorts, here's a real fact. I definitely was able to get 10,000 new subscribers, and those are going to be mm-hmm. subscribers for long form and short form. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of graphs uh, you might be interested in, Andrew. This first one, or to the right, you'll see the past 365 days, uh, Bit of a bump. <laughs> yeah, looks like a uh, cl- now. Is that a cliff? That looks like a very high cliff. Uh, just so uh, I got, everyone at home, just picture uh, a jiggly line and then a line straight up. <laughs> it's a yeah, right and angle. Guess, and my point is saying is like I'm not 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 dunking on YouTube Shorts. I think it's a good strategy they've done, and I reluctantly found myself watching more of them than I plan to. Uh, I do think a dedicated app would be amazing. My point was to sort of say you'll adapt you're yeah. you're not like the guy the the vine dude who all of a sudden woke up one day and there's no platform right you yeah. know so so you're that's the ability of having spent time in the game is you're like okay i know how to get the most out of this here's a new platform let me figure out how this works let me go in there yeah. and do what i can and put in the right production resources to make it happen and we'll do it and i know there's going to be another thing coming and another thing yeah. and i'm not like you know the, the the youtuber who goes in there with their friends to get their you know the, the the YouTuber mansion and then all of a sudden watches numbers flatline and then is back and leaving their parents. Yeah. Well, and uh, and and you're right. And I am a little bit hesitant to be ebullient about it, you know, because I'm I'm cautious. Also, if you look at the graph um, for the uh, uh, first of all, this lifetime graph. Uh, to your point, Andrew, that you never know when your peak is going to be. I did not expect. I th- I thought I had already peaked in my entire experience of YouTube. I thought YouTube would be gone before I would have the opportunity to uh, do 2x or whatever uh, that, that, that we just experienced on view count. But, but on the flip side, I'm very aware that viewer minutes, because it's a very short form content, they do track every second. They track every single second. Mm-hmm. The viewer minutes is just about average. It's like as though we did four full length videos this month instead of you know 30 shorts. But, yeah. but I mean, those, uh, the de- demographically, those are going to be younger people. Those are going to be people who discover the back catalog. And it was YouTube that, uh, it wasn't us that said watch time. YouTube said watch time was important. Like, well, and, it, and, and it, it, it is, uh, it, insofar it, as, you know, that's how you get to be comfortable with someone is by spending a lot of time with them. Sure, but uh, there are not other metrics. I, th- I feel like watch time is sometimes a little unfair just inherently agreed because Um, that's a a, a most famously that's how people end up at the bottom of rabbit holes that lead to flat eartherism or that's how that's how info wars rose to prominence is somebody just types in ww2 and because it kept on rewarding longer and longer streams the guy running for six hours straight every single day was was the one that you know got hundreds of millions of, of, of views um and I, I, I've not spent a lot of time grappling with this, but this has been sitting in my head for a while, which is like, how long are we, how long is YouTube? How long, how long is YouTube? How the, long is you, how long is YouTube? The, uh, as a matter of fact, I just listened to this week's episode of uh, Freakonomics Radio, and the promo for next week was the story of, hey, remember when Google was good? Like, it was like magic and you found things, and now... How do you feel about the internet just just in general and how much of that is straight up alphabet corporations fault and uh that's that's a legit question that we were not (laughs) we we were not asking and uh uh, uh, man i would i I, i'm gonna listen to that podcast probably i i think a lot about gmail you remember gmail gmail the especially the beta right everyone wanted an invite so you could get the free gigabyte or whatever of attachment and uh you know, I feel like when we were in that big rush to get, oh, I gotta get the Gmail. We're evolving email. Um, then the the things that Google's doing now with my data, I probably wouldn't have consented to, or would have had more thoughts about at the time. 
but because I, re- I remember it was like, it was Google was the different company, you know, you would install stuff. And instead of having the big terms and conditions, it would be like, we're just going to talk to you in plain text, just read, you know, like it felt different. And now it's just another big IBM I, to some degree. I've said, I've said this before. Well, uh, IBM wishes they were Google. Um, <laughs> I've said this before, but like, um, to me, like Google's a company and they're incentivized towards what they do, which they decided advertising early on and the challenge to advertising, like uh, I'm a big Apple fan, but Apple opened up the floodgates of app- advertising in the app oh, yeah. store. And all of a sudden people selling kids apps were getting, getting casino in game, you know, people with gambling addiction were getting pushed gambling apps and stuff, which is just, you know, a thing they quickly remedied, but that's a challenge. But when the, the sketchiest big, internet advertising firm was double click like double click was the one doing the tracking cookies double click was the one that you're always you're buying trying to you know build you know buying filters and stuff to sort of you'd clear your cookies and stuff because of the amount of tracking you'd get there whatever and they're always like there well they don't want to be bad like them they're the sketchy ones well then google bought them hmm. and then it was like okay i get it we all understand what the game is. And I remember I remember when they said they did their IPO. I had a friend who was an investment banker. And I'm like, they say do no, they're, they they're going to be like, do, do no evil. And he's just like, ah, ha, ha, you summer child in the book that hasn't been written yet. Ah, ha, 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 you know, and I, I'm like, I'm like, no, like, there. but it's like you are what you're incentivized for. And that is your incentivized, your incentives define you. And we talked in the last podcast, we talked about like uh, FTX and you know, what may be the problem is there's FTX and then there was an investment company and both owned by the same guy who's incentivized towards making money. Now people go, oh, well, he's, he's been this, he's this philanthropist. He's donated all this money. Like, well, you'd be generous too. If you had that much, you know, free money (laughs) coming your way. Uh, And apparently it looks like that may have been trying to hide something, but his, my point about the incentive, what is he incentivized for? Well, and at this trying to make, and and it, uh, uh, just to put a button on the YouTube thing, um, it seems so far, uh, we'll see what happens after they monetize it. We'll see what happens after their revenue splits. Right now, we're doing everything just based on sort of an Oklahoma Sooner land rush mentality where it's like um, sure. uh, TikTok being the number one search engine ahead of Google is is suggests to me that Google has gotten the message that short form content it matters and that they're serious about getting it right this time because they definitely screwed it up last uh, their first attempt you know what uh just uh to talk about because we're talking about search uh so th- i i saw i saw a tiktok <laughs> saying <laughs> that uh the younger crowd is searching on tiktok for answers and for things yep. before they go to google and now a feature on tiktok is uh if you use a keyword in your video or in the description or in the comments, if someone uses a keyword that the app thinks is related to your video, it will turn that into a clickable search link. So if if you're on a if you've made a video about like I don't know body painting, right? And there's like a famous body like there's a body painter who's in the news for some reason. If someone makes a comment about that, it says as uh, oh uh, tell this to person whatever. YouTube or TikTok will automatically, will tr- in some cases, take that name and make it a search term that you can click on and just go to like their search. Like search is is not a small deal. It's why it's the middle yeah. of Google's entire company. And this is is this is a this is a break fast <laughs> a break break things fast sort of situation. Yeah, bre- a, a move fast, break things yeah. kind of engineering solution. And, uh, um, because tic- uh, because YouTube would never do that. YouTube would never put clickable yeah, search links I in their comments. I don't, about, I don't know about never, but <laughs> but 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 not yet. <laughs> I would have not. I would never. I would never have put it on their radar to come up with that idea. Yeah. Uh, TikTok, however, there's only one star on TikTok, and it's TikTok. And uh, yeah. whereas whereas YouTube, at least so far, has maintained the facade, and this seems to be a doubling down. Um, the, there is uh, just for those who like the insider sauce. Uh, I have seen an almost doubling of uh, views on the long form content. Most people say that uh, shorts don't increase the uh, use of their long form content, but everything that we've done, we've tried to be evergreen on. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, like a cool magic trick 10 years ago is still a cool magic trick today, even if the format and the hairstyles are dated. Uh, and, And by exposing a new audience, you know, we are 
hungry for a younger demographic uh, because that's it, what it our tur- turns out magicians like to be around 15 years old. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm v- boy, if, if YouTube sticks to their guns as they seem, to, if they keep doing what it looks like they're doing, then our little operation will be well positioned to, you know, celebrate the back catalog of content. Yeah. And YouTube is still like two or three times bigger than TikTok. You know, they still have that many more monthly active users. And so I think, I think if they put shorts into an app, I think they really need to put it into its own app. They've, um, they have done a good job of splitting out. It, it should just be its own app or it needs to have like a no, a no shorts mode, but th- they're never going to do that because it's YouTube and they want all that splash damage. But they, well, they, but no, I think they may build an app. Like I, I think a high probability they'll build an app. Eventually, I, yes, but I bet you will. St- I bet that won't that won't remove shorts out of the primary YouTube app. No, no, I, I agree. I don't. That, yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I think that'll be yeah. But but one of the nice things that they've done recently, um, just in the past, I want to say a uh, week or so, is uh, uh, on on a on your channel page, shorts now have their own tab, so they don't clutter up your videos tab. Oh, your good. videos is still long form. And the shorts specifically looks a lot like the TikTok. Sort oh, that's of vertical much thumb. better. Boy, was that a disaster aesthetically. It was, it yeah, was awful. That's, that's what drove me. What pushed me off of shorts was I would see a new thing come up and I'd be like, oh, I'd watch it. Like, I just watched this in the video I watched, mm-hmm. you know, yesterday. And I'm like, you know, I get it. Like, that, you know, that's where you put a great place to pull content from. But putting that into the feed is like, here's something. It's like Apple iTunes. Oh, there's a new episode of Rick and Morty. No, it's a two minute behind the scenes. They right. talk about uh, it, but they'll call it an episode and you're like, wah, wah. Uh, so I, I have a very roundabout pick and my pick Ooh. is Twitter. Uh, remember when Twitter was a place where you could randomly bump into places and have public conversations and make new friends? Guess what? Uh, it still is. Over the weekend, I posted uh, just that screenshot of the spike in traffic, and I said, I'll, I'll report on it. And uh, uh, Greg from the How to Drink YouTube channel piped in uh, or chipped in saying, um, at this point, you know, given how short they are, aren't they pretty much just like impressions? Aren't they like tweets? And I and mm-hmm. and we had a back and forth discussion that quickly moved to DMs that quickly moved to yesterday, having a wonderful conversation on the phone, talking about um, a, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about right here on After Things. And all of that was sparked by him just asking a question on a Twitter thread. And uh, so I'm, I'm thankful that those kind of interactions still get to happen. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter is great. I love Twitter. Do most people know how to use Twitter? No. You well, know, and they're uh, all Twitter, using it Twitter, not the way I want. Yeah. Well, no, I, I mean that they can use it however they want, but the people who complain about it, the people who are bitching about Twitter and going, ah, this, 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 I'm like, what are you doing? Like, like it's, it's like pain medication. You got to use it right. You know? And you know, so I, my point is like to say like that people like, Oh, we got to get rid of Twitter. I know people just hate it. And I'm like, what do you hate about it? And it's like, that there are voices that you disagree with that are there. Is that what it comes down to? Is that what bothers you? Like what, what, what's the upsetting part? And like, I, I think that, you know, the more robust you are at entertaining different ideas, the more mentally healthy you are. Crazy thought. Well, but in, my, uh, my, my point, I, I suspect there's a longer than three minute conversation to be had on this topic of, of, of filtering and self filtering and, you know, uh, shaping our own experience. Yeah. I was just, what I was going to get to is that like, I've had a great experience cause I use lists and I filter it. Twitter, it, Twitter amazes me because, you know, right now everybody's using Twitter to complain about Twitter, including people who work at Twitter, which is kind of hilarious to me. Uh, and that just shows you the robustness of the platform of, you know, like, ah, then, I, then twi- I, I want to. Twitter boost. sends emails saying, hey, did you see this angry tweet thread about Twitter? <laughs> it's amazing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's just, it's just, I hope it succeeds, you know. Um, and obviously, there's, it's been a uh, part of a bit of a dumpster fire, but I don't know how you change always is like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other picks? Uh, uh, 
I, this is a half pick, but I'm back. On, I'm back on my things. S word. I'm back on the things app. What? You yeah. gave up on on killing trees? Did you not have enough note cards? I know a guy. I can hook you up. <laughs> no, I still have the note cards, but I just I I specifically we have talked about structured so many times on this show now. I'm at, it's gone. I've purged the evil from my phone. Thank you. You tried very hard. Structured. Goodbye. Um, I'm back to using the things app. The things app is great. Things app. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. You're, you're, you're cutting up. Me some time. Oh, uh, sorry. Can you can you say that again, Andrew? We lost you. I, I said I was glad. Sure. Uh, we lost you Bad again. Connection. What? I was um, glad to watch this journey. Okay. Oh no! He was. Oh no! <laughs> uh, they don't want it. They don't want us to finish. They want us to finish the conversation on Twitter.com. I'm Alex Jones' voice, Bryce, for some reason. <laughs> Are you back, Andrew? Uh, I don't know if you hear me or not. I do. Yes. But I'm just going to say I've enjoyed watching this the, the start of this journey, the end of the journey for you as structured. So <laughs> you saved me a journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's news you can use here on the After Things podcast. <laughs> How's it been? Oh, we froze up. All right. Oh, checking out because the audio. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Bryce, I think it's been after. I also think it's been after. <laughs> okay, I think he left. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what about her? Uh, sorry, Andrew. It, it does seem like it's always at the end that, that, yeah. that we get a. It's three thirty. Maybe maybe he's got maybe he's got neighbors who need to have their have their fix of White Lotus MKV files on BitTorrent. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody. Well, uh, uh, thank you to Andrew for uh, valiantly helping us here finish out the show. Uh, that was exciting to hear your live react. Bryce reacts to uh, <laughs> seeing the numbers that are happening. I on didn't realize right we now. broke a two milli. That's that's. I don't think I. I, uh, I sometimes I go back and look and see how many of my videos have broken a million, and it's not as high as some of the other. Uh, well, and, uh, uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> but uh, that's that's exciting. That's very cool. All right. We're going to go offline. We'll be back with Cord Killers in a little bit. It'll be the three of us. Say yeah. goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye. Watch shorts. <laughs> Eat them. Eat them.